still for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Be still for the glory of the Lord is shining all around. He burns with holy fire, with splendor. Well, good morning, folks, and a warm welcome to your service. It's good to see you here. And uh, let me just run through the announcements uh, before we begin the service properly. Uh, we meet again for prayer this evening at 6.30 in the Nelson Room before our service of worship at 7. It'd be good to see you back again this evening as we worship God. And then after the evening service uh, this evening, there'll be a special prayer meeting uh, for the Youth Fellowship Weekend. Uh, and uh, uh, it won't take too long, so I think it'll be like last week when we had uh, tea and coffee immediately after the service, and then we'll uh, spend time in prayer uh, for the Youth Fellowship Weekend. Uh, Lisa and David have also, uh, well, they're going to leave a, a prayer letter about the YF Weekend in the vestibule for the congregation to take away, and so it's to let you know a bit about the young people, and it lists uh, different uh, things to pray for in terms of the weekend next uh, weekend, the Easter weekend. Uh, there's, so there's one prayer letter per household, uh, so that should be ready for you as you leave the church. Then the PW will meet on uh, Monday, tomorrow night at 7.45, and the speaker will be Willie Logan, who is the General Secretary of the Belfast City Mission. Uh, all ladies are welcome to that. Again, you don't have to be a member of the PW to, to go along. Uh, anyone is welcome to go to that meeting tomorrow at 7.45. Uh, the Bright Hour will meet on Tuesday afternoon at the slightly earlier time of 2.30, so the ladies of the Bright Hour should bear that in mind, please. And uh, then on Wednesday, instead of the uh, midweek Bible study and prayer meeting, we're hoping to go around the district, uh, and Alan's going to say something about that. Alan. Well, good morning, everyone. As Colin has said, uh, we're planning our Easter tract distribution uh, this, uh, this Wednesday evening. And again, we're, we're asking you for your support. Um, the tract really has a, a twofold purpose. Uh, one is to advertise our, our services over uh, next Easter weekend, uh, both here and in Westkirk, where we're sharing next, uh, next Sunday evening. Of course, the other, the other purpose, the main purpose, of course, is to, to share the, the gospel message uh, of Easter. And you'll see in the tract, uh, the, uh, the text that has been chosen this year, Matthew 28, verse 6, he is not here, he has risen, just as he said. Um, now, we're planning to do something a little bit different this year, uh, in the sense that we're planning to split between the, the normal door drop that we do, of just putting these in through, through people's letter boxes, uh, and also we're also planning to knock some doors uh, uh, with visitation, uh, led by our elders. Um, so it's also not our, our, our plan this year to visit the, uh, the Shankill Estate, the other side of Agnes Street, or indeed the Old Park area, but really the area between the Crumlin Road and, and the Shankill Road. As you can imagine, there are a lot of houses there, and we have a print run, I think, of about a thousand of these. Uh, so if you can help with either the door drop, or if you'd like to come along, perhaps accompanied by an elder or someone else, we normally go two by two uh, to a door, uh, please, please join with us on Wednesday evening. Uh, we meet at the earlier time of 7 p.m. At 7 p.m. on Wednesday evening, we'll hopefully get ourselves organized uh, to go out then. And obviously, thankfully, the, the, the daylight is still with us at that time. Of course, all endeavors, as we know, are, are fruitless uh, without prayer. So we'd ask you now, or, or between now and, and Wednesday evening, uh, you know, we might pray for a number of things. We can pray, certainly, uh, so God might grant us good weather. Uh, as we go out, uh, we may pray that, that God will use even a, uh, one uh, small portion of his word, a gospel verse, and we bless that and, and, and use it for his purposes. And of course, you can also pray that even now, um, God may be preparing someone for a visit. 
there may be someone in the district this time uh, who's seeking, who's lost, and is seeking. So pray for those things, please. That's Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. Just one other uh, small announcement. At the Kirk session meeting last Monday evening, uh, we agreed to, to name or to, to call the, the new refurbished area here uh, behind me. Uh, this, this will now be known in future as the link, uh, in recognition really that it is a, a link or a connecting area uh, between the, the meeting house here and the, uh, the various rooms and various halls that we have. So to avoid any confusion, we sometimes refer to different names, the foyer and, and so forth. But from now on, if you hear us talking about the link, or gathering in the link, that, that's, what we're, that's what we're talking about. So thank you again for your attention. Thank you, Alan. And then the final announcement is about next weekend, of course, Easter weekend, and we're going to join with West Kirk again, as we did last year. So they'll join us here on Good Friday at 7 o'clock uh, for a Good Friday service. Uh, then we'll have our service as normal here on Easter uh, morning. Uh, but on Easter Sunday evening, we're going to go over to Westkirk and uh, worship with them in their building. Uh, their service, though, is at 6 o'clock, so bear that in mind for uh, next weekend. Uh, we'll be here on Friday at 7 o'clock. We'll be here on Sunday morning as normal at 11.30, but then at 6 o'clock next Sunday, we'll be over at Westkirk uh, joining with them to worship God. Those are all the announcements, and in Psalm 145, it's the psalmist says, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Well, let's uh, bless God's name now. Let's praise his name by standing to sing praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Pray. 
Almighty God, our Father, we praise you because you are the Almighty, the King of creation, who made all things in the beginning and who rules over all that you have made. And you're the one who keeps us safe at your side. You're the one who so gently sustains us. You're the one who ordains all things and you provide us with all that we need. You're the one whose goodness and mercy daily attends us. You're the one we can count on and rely on each day. And so we bow in your presence and we worship and adore you because there's none like you who is so great and so mighty and so full of steadfast love and faithfulness. And will you help us to praise you today? Will you help us to receive your word with faith and humility? Will you help us to give thanks to you in our prayers and our praise? And will you help us as we turn to the Lord's table to receive by faith the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, and all the benefits of his life and death and resurrection? And so will you work through these, the ordinary means of grace, to reassure us of your love and your faithfulness and your willingness to forgive our sins and to enable us to persevere in the faith. And we ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. If you've got a Bible, please turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 9. Uh, again, we've got a long reading this morning, uh, so I'm going to read uh, part of it now, and then later on Russell's going to come and uh, complete the reading. So yesterday, or last week, we got to uh, verse 9 of 1 Kings chapter 9. Today, we're going to read from verse 10 to the end of the chapter. 1 Kings chapter 9 and verse 10, this is the word of the Lord. At the end of 20 years, during which Solomon built these two buildings, the temple of the Lord and the royal palace, King Solomon gave 20 towns in Galilee to Haram, king of Tyre, because Haram had supplied him with all the cedar and pine and gold he wanted. But when Haram went from Tyre to see the towns that Solomon had given him, he was not pleased with them. What kind of towns are these you have given me, my brother, he asked. And he called them the land of Kabul, a name they have to this day. Now Haram had sent to the king 120 talents of gold. Here is the account of the forced labor King Solomon conscripted to build the Lord's temple, his own palace, the supporting terraces, the wall of Jerusalem and Hazor, Medigo and Gezer. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had attacked and captured Gezer. He had set it on fire. He killed its Canaanite inhabitants and then gave it as a wedding gift to his daughter, Solomon's wife. And Solomon rebuilt Gezer. He built up Lower Beth Horon, Balalath, and Tadmor in the desert within his land, as well as all his store cities and the towns for the chariots and for his horses, whatever he desired to build in Jerusalem, in Lebanon, and throughout all the territory he ruled. All the people left from the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, these peoples were not Israelites. That is, their descendants remaining in the land whom the Israelites could not exterminate, these Solomon conscripted for his slave labor force, as it is to this day. But Solomon did not make slaves of any of the Israelites. They were his fighting men, his government officials, his officers, his captains, and the commanders of his chariots and charioteers. They were also the chief officials in charge of Solomon's projects, 550 officials supervising the men who did the work. After Pharaoh's daughter had come up from the city of David to the palace Solomon had built for her, he constructed the supporting terraces. Three times a year, Solomon sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings on the altar he had built for the Lord, burning incense before the Lord along with them, and so fulfilled the temple obligations. King Solomon also built ships at Izion Geber, which is near Elath in Edom, on the shore of the Red Sea, and Haram sent his men, sailors who knew the sea, to serve in the fleet with Solomon's men. They sailed to Orphir and brought back 420 talents of gold, which they delivered to King Solomon. And we'll uh, pause the reading there, and as I say, we'll come back to it in a few minutes. 
Let's uh, turn to God to confess our sins. Let's pray. Have mercy on us, O God, our Father, according to your steadfast love and according to your abundant mercy. Blot out our transgressions, wash us thoroughly from our iniquity and cleanse us from all our sin. For we know our transgressions and how from our childhood until this very day we have sinned against your law by our sinful thoughts and words and desires and deeds which are too many to count. We confess that we haven't loved you as we should. And so we confess it if we have not put you above all other things, or if we have not worshipped you in the way that you have commanded us, or if we have dishonored your name by the things we have done and said, or if we have not remembered to keep the Lord's day holy. And we confess that we have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. And so we confess it if we have not given our neighbors the honor they deserve, or if we have harmed their life, or if we've spoiled their marriage, or if we've stolen their property, or if we've ruined their reputation, or if we've coveted their property. Heavenly Father, we confess that we're sinners, and we break your laws and commandments every day, and we're sorry. We're sorry for all the ways we have disobeyed you and for all the ways we have fallen short of doing your will. We ask that you'll not treat us as our sins deserve and we pray that you'll not repay us according to our iniquity. Instead, will you have mercy on us and will you forgive us our sins for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who died for us and for our salvation. And will you give to all who trust in your Son the joy of knowing that we have been forgiven? And will you give us the hope of everlasting life in your presence? And will you help us day by day to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled and upright and godly lives while we wait for our Savior to come again? Help us by your Spirit, to know more and more and to do more and more your will and help us to bring glory and honor to you by the way we live each day. And we ask it all in our Savior's name. Amen. (coughs) And having confessed our sins, hear the good news from John 3. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Thanks be to God for his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And uh, now just before the children go out to Children's Church, we're going to stand and sing the children's hymn, Jesus Loves Me.
And Russell's going to read to us now from uh, 1 Kings. Hope you have your Bibles open. We're going to continue our reading from 1 Kings, and we'll start at chapter 10. Here's the word of the Lord. When the Queen of Sheba heard about the famous Solomon and his relationship to the Lord, she came to test Solomon with hard questions. Arriving at Jerusalem with a very great caravan, with camels carrying spices, large quantities of gold and precious stones, she came to Solomon and talked with him about all that she had on her mind. <clears throat> Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was too hard for the king to explain to her. When the Queen of Sheba saw all the wisdom of Solomon and the palace he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his officials, the attending servants in the robes, his cupbearers, and the burnt offerings he made at the temple of the Lord, she was overwhelmed. She said to the king, the report I heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true. But I did not believe these things until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half was told to me, and wisdom and wealth you have far exceeded the report I heard. How happy your people must be. How happy, how happy your officials who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Praise be to the Lord your God, who has delighted in you and placed you on the throne of Israel. Because of the Lord's eternal love for Israel, he has made you king to maintain justice and righteousness. And she gave the king 120 talents of gold, large quantities of spice and precious stones. Never again were so many spices brought in as those the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Harim ships brought gold from Ophir, and from there they brought great cargoes of almug wood and precious stones. The king used the almug wood to make supports for the temple of the Lord and for the royal palace and to make harps and lyres for the musicians. So much almug wood has never been imported or seen since that day. King Solomon gave the Queen of Sheba all she desired and asked for, besides what he had given her out of his royal bounty. Then she left and returned with her retinue to her own country. The weight of the gold that Solomon received yearly was 666 talents, not including the revenues from merchants and traders and from all the Arabian kings and the governors of the territories. King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold 600 shekels of gold went into each shield. He also made 300 small shields of hammered gold and three mangles of gold in each shield. The king put them in the palace of the forest of Lebanon. Then the king made a great throne covered with ivory and overlaid with fine gold. The throne had six steps and in its back had a rounded top. On both sides of the seat were armrests with lands standing beside each of them. Twelve lands stood on the six steps, one at each end of each step. Nothing like it had ever been seen, no, nothing, sorry, nothing like it had ever been made for any other kingdom. All King Solomon's goblets were gold, and the household articles in the palace of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. Nothing was made of silver, because silver was considered of little value in Solomon's day. The king had a fleet of trading ships at sea along with the ships of Haram. Once every three years, it returned carrying gold, silver, and ivory, and apes and baboons. King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the kings of the earth. The whole world sought audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom God had put in his heart. Year after year, everyone who came brought a gift, articles of silver and gold, robes, weapons and spices, and horses and mules. Solomon accumulated chariots and horses. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses, which he kept in the chariot cities and also with him in Jerusalem. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones and cedar as plentiful as sycamore fig trees in the foothills. Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt and from Kerr. The royal merchant purchased them from Kerr at the current price. They imported a chariot from Egypt for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150. 
He also exported them to all the kings of the Hittites of the, and of the Armenians. Armenians. Amen. Let's pray now. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our <coughs> rock and our redeemer. Amen. Uh, so Solomon has finished uh, building uh, the temple and the, the palace complex in Jerusalem where he, he lived and did his work. And when he dedicated the temple to the Lord, uh, the Lord's glory cloud appeared and, and filled the temple to signify that the Lord had moved into his new home, which Solomon had built for him. And uh, that it was a sign that he would dwell among his people in that place. And last week we read how the Lord appeared to Solomon and warned him about what could go wrong. So what could go wrong? Uh, well, the people of Israel could turn away from the Lord and go after other gods to serve and worship them. And if they did that, if they turned away from the Lord, then he will cut them off from the land by sending them into exile. And the temple will be destroyed and whoever passes by and sees what had become of Jerusalem will be appalled and they'll know that it happened because the people forsook the Lord and embraced other gods. And as I said, last week, the Lord was not only describing what could go wrong, but what uh, did actually go wrong, because the people of Israel did turn from the Lord. They went after other gods to serve and worship them, and the Lord sent them into exile, and the city of Jerusalem with its temple was destroyed. But that hasn't happened yet, and it won't happen for many generations. And for now, everything is going well in, Jeris or in, in Jerusalem and in Israel. And that's certainly the message we receive from chapter 10, where we read how the Queen of Sheba visited Solomon, and she was overwhelmed by all she saw and heard. How happy your men must be, she said. How happy your officials must be who get to stand in your presence every day and hear your wisdom. And then in the second half of chapter 10, it's as if the writer is saying to us, and there's more, there's more. The Queen of Sheba was impressed, but she didn't see the half of it. And there's so much more that is wonderful and impressive about Solomon's reign. But before we get to chapter 10, there's the rest of chapter 9, which we didn't get to study last week. And the NIV gives this section uh, the title, Solomon's Other Activities. And that's an accurate a title because this is a kind of list of the things that he did and it's a mixed bag of things and uh, it's not exactly clear how we're meant to take some of these things as I've said before some of the commentators are very critical of Solomon and they're ready to complain about almost everything he did uh, others are more positive about him However, even the most positive commentators raise an eyebrow about some of the things we read here. Uh, for instance, take verses 10 to 15 of uh, chapter 9, where we read that Solomon gave 20 towns in Galilee to Haram, king of Tyre. Uh, this was as payment for all that Haram had given to Solomon, because Haram had sent all the cedar and pine Solomon needed for his building projects. And according to verse 11, Haram also supplied Solomon with gold. And if you glance down to verse 14, you'll see that it says that Haram sent Solomon 120 talents of gold, which is about four tons of gold. It's in a massive amount. And in return for all the timber and gold, Solomon offered to give Haram these 20 towns in Galilee. And you should raise an eyebrow when you read that because he's giving away part of the promised land. The land of Israel was God's gift to the people of Israel. It was their inheritance which they received from the Lord. It was the land God promised to give to them and to their descendants. So what was Solomon thinking when he decided to give part of it away to a foreign king? It makes no sense. Furthermore, Haram wasn't impressed with the towns. He said, what kind of towns are these you have given me, my brother? And he named them Kabul. And the little footnote uh, beside the word Kabul tells you that the word sounds like the Hebrew for good for nothing. These 20 towns were good for nothing. 
And so you can raise another eyebrow because this is no way to treat a friendly neighbor. Um, a few weeks ago, we were praising Solomon for the way he was able to maintain a good working relationship with Haram. But now he's giving Haram his leftovers, towns he didn't want and won't miss. And that's no way to treat a friend. And let's think about his building projects, which we read about in verses 15 to 24. Uh, it mentions the temple and his own palace complex, the supporting terraces, the wall of Jerusalem and various cities, which he built, including towns to keep his chariots and horses. He managed to build whatever he wanted to build in Jerusalem and in Lebanon and throughout all of his kingdom. And uh, that's all impressive, and it's a sign of how prosperous and successful he had become. And it's also evidence of how God had blessed him and made Israel a happy place to be. And as one of the commentators puts it, this is what kings do. They build things. However, back in Deuteronomy 17, the Lord said through Moses that the kings of Israel must not acquire great numbers of horses for themselves. So why does Solomon have so many chariots and horses that he needs to build towns to store them? And so you should raise an eyebrow uh, about that. Uh, some of the commentators complain about Solomon's use of forced labor. Uh, we read about the forced labor in verse 15 and also in verses 20 to 23. However, our narrator is careful to point out in verse 22 that Solomon did not make slaves of any of the Israelites. Instead, the Israelites were employed as his fighting men and government officials and so on. The slaves who were forced to work for him were, according to verse 20, all the people left from the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, and, and so on. These were the Canaanites, the people who lived in the land of Canaan before God gave the land to the Israelites. And you might recall that Joshua was told to kill them all. None of them should be allowed to remain on the land, otherwise they'll just lead the Israelites astray. And you might remember that killing the uh, Canaanites wasn't an act of terrorism or genocide. It was an act of judgment. God was using the Israelites to punish the Canaanites for their great wickedness. However, Joshua and his men weren't able to kill them all, and some survived. King David was able to remove some of them in his day, but again, it seems that some survived. But instead of killing them, Solomon made them his slaves and set them to work on his building sites. And so while we might be tempted to raise an eyebrow because Solomon enslaved these people, nevertheless, enslaving them was part of God's judgment on them for their wickedness over many generations. And while there are some things which Solomon did which we might question, we can't help but notice his devotion to the Lord. According to verse 25, he sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings on the altar three times each year. Uh, the narrator is probably referring to the three great feasts which were held each year, the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of the Tabernacles. And um, Burnt offerings were for, for forgiveness, Fellowship offerings were to celebrate that we have peace with God. And Solomon offered these uh, sacrifices and burned incense as well, so he fulfilled the temple obligations. He didn't fail to worship the Lord, but he offered all of the necessary sacrifices. And verses 26 to 28 tell us how he built a fleet of ships, and the ships went back and forth between Israel and or Orpher. Uh, no one really knows where that place is. Some have suggested it was in India or maybe it was in the Arabian Peninsula, or maybe it was in East Africa. Wherever it was, Solomon sent his ships there, and they came back with lots and lots and lots of gold. And notice that the narrator mentions harem, uh, so it seems that he and Solomon didn't fall out over the 20 good-for-nothing towns. And since they were able to ba bring back all of this gold from their travels, then I'm sure harem was glad of his partnership and friendship with Solomon. And so what are we to make of all of uh, Solomon's other activities? Some of what we read uh, causes us to raise an eyebrow or two. However, what we read about him also matches the impression we got in previous chapters that Israel was a happy place to be. 
God had blessed Solomon's reign so that the, nations were, the nation was prosperous and everyone had plenty. And so perhaps we can say that the, the things that raise an eyebrow are helpful. They're helpful because they make clear that while Solomon was a great king, he wasn't the greatest king. Though he was king of kings in his lifetime, he was not king of kings forever. The king of kings forever is the Lord Jesus Christ, who rules with justice and righteousness, and who never does anything wrong at all, because everything he does, everything he does is right and good and perfect, because he's the king of kings, and he's the eternal son of God, and he's infinitely and eternally and unchangeably wise and powerful and holy and just and good and true. And that takes us then to chapter 10 and to the visit of the Queen, she Queen of Sheba. And uh, no one really knows where Sheba was located, but again, some uh, commentators think it was on the Arabian Peninsula, uh, around modern-day Yemen, uh, which is around 1,300 miles from Jerusalem. And so the queen traveled a long way to meet Solomon, the king of kings. We're told in verse 1 that she heard about Solomon's fame. So perhaps some of Solomon's ships traveled to Sheba. And people there heard about Solomon's wisdom and wealth and the glory of Israel. And notice that it says in verse 1 that she heard about Solomon's fame and about the name of the Lord. So she didn't just hear stories about Solomon, but she also heard stories about the Lord. And you can't hear about one without hearing about the other, because the secret of Solomon's success was the Lord who had blessed him. And anyone who heard about the Lord, we'd also end up hearing about the Lord's uh, great King Solomon. And the queen traveled all the way from Sheba to test Solomon with hard questions. She'd obviously heard about his wisdom and his knowledge of the natural world, and she wanted to see if it was true. And when she arrived, she talked with Solomon about all she had in her mind. And if you look at verse 3, it says, Solomon was able to answer all of her questions. Nothing was too hard for him to explain to her. And so when she saw his wisdom and the palace he had built and the food on his table and all the rest, she was overwhelmed. It left her breathless, speechless. She was overwhelmed because of his wisdom and his wealth. And so we have her testimony in verses 6 to 9. What did she say about Solomon? She said, the report I have heard about you was true. Well, how often are we uh, disappointed? You know, uh, we hear about someone or something. You should go and meet uh, this person. You should go and see this thing. You should read this book. You should watch this movie. You should eat at this restaurant. And we go and it's only a disappointment. But Sheba was not disappointed at all by Solomon. In fact, she says that she didn't really believe what she had heard about him. It seemed it was going to be too good to be true. And yet now that she had met him and had seen his kingdom with her own eyes and rested his wisdom, she realized that the report she heard about him wasn't even half as good as the reality. She said, in wisdom and wealth, you have far exceeded the report I heard. And so she went on to say that his men must be so happy and his officials must be so happy to be able to stand in his presence every day and hear his wisdom. Uh, many people come home from work and they're frustrated because the the people they work with annoy them and say foolish and stupid things. But what a delight for Solomon's men to go into work each day to hear Solomon's wisdom. And Sheba went on to praise God who has delighted in Solomon and has placed him on the throne. So the Lord was under no obligation to Solomon. He didn't owe Solomon anything. He wasn't required to bless Solomon. No one was forcing him to bless Solomon. This was something God himself delighted to do. He was pleased to do it. He chose to do it freely and graciously. And it was also because of God's eternal love for Israel that he made Solomon king. What a joy and delight for Israel to have a king who would rule over them with justice and righteousness. 
so that everything he did and all of his decisions were just and right. That was the queen's testimony. And she gave the king lots of gifts and the king gave her whatever she desired and asked for, plus other gifts which he gave her from out of his royal bounty. And so loaded down with gifts, she returned home. And the chapter could have ended there and uh, we could go away amazed because of what we've heard of Solomon's wisdom and wealth. But as I said at the beginning, we also have the second half of chapter 10. And uh, it's as if the writer is saying to us, and there's more. The queen of Sheba was impressed, but she didn't see the half of it. And there's so much more that is wonderful and impressive about Solomon's reign. So look at verse 14. The weight of gold that Solomon received was 666 talents. That's about 22 tons. That's what he received in a year. And that didn't include the revenues he received from merchants and traders and from others, including kings, as taxation and tribute. And so he was able to make 200 large shields of gold as well as 300 small shields of gold. And these were placed in the palace of the forest in his palace complex. And he was able to make a great throne which was inlaid with uh, ivory and gold and there were steps going up to it and there were statues of lions or presumably there were statues of lions on each step. And all his goblets were made of gold and all the household articles in the palace were gold too. No plastic in his palace. And look at the end of verse 21 where it says that nothing was made of silver because silver was considered of little value. Why use silver when you can have gold? And then our narrator tells us again about the fleet of ships which crossed the sea and every three years the fleet returned with more gold, more silver, more ivory, as well as apes and baboons, all kinds of treasures and precious things from around the world are being brought to Solomon in Jerusalem. The wealth of the nations was coming to him. And just as we have uh, Sheba's testimony in verses 6 to 9, now in verses 23 to 25, we have the narrator's testimony. King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. The whole world sought audience with him to hear the wisdom God had given him. Year after year, everyone who came to meet him brought a gift. And so his wealth kept growing and growing year by year. There was no other king like him. He was the king of kings. He was wealthier than every other king. He was wiser than every other king. No one could compare with him. And so he accumulated chariots and horses and silver was as common as stones and cedar was as common as sycamore fig trees. He imported his horses and chariots from faraway places and he exported them as well. And we're left almost breathless, aren't we? We're like the Queen of Sheba because we're overwhelmed by Solomon's wealth and wisdom. How happy his people must be to have a king like him who rules with justice and righteousness. It all seems too good to be true. And yet, as I said last week, in due course, it was all gone. It was all gone. The kings who came after Solomon did not measure up to him. And while some were good, none were as great as Solomon. Many were wicked. And the people of Israel turned away from the Lord and they went after false gods and served and worshipped them. And therefore the Lord sent them into exile, into a far off country. And the city of Jerusalem with its temple was destroyed. And all the gold was taken away. But then we have the prophet Isaiah who prophesied in Isaiah chapter 11 about the coming of a new king. Uh, on whom the spirit of the Lord would rest, the spirit of wisdom and understanding and counsel and power, a king who will rule with justice and righteousness, and the nations of the world will rally to him. And in Isaiah 60, Isaiah spoke of a time when the glory of the Lord will rise on Jerusalem and the wealth of the seas will be brought to it and the riches of the nations will come and all from Sheba will come bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. The gates of the city will stand open and will never be shut even at night so that men may bring the wealth of the nations into it. After the glory of the days of Solomon had passed, Isaiah announced that those days would return. 
and the nations will come once again because of the new king who will be born, who will rule with justice and righteousness. Isaiah was anticipating the coming of Christ the king, and the nations are coming to him in the sense that all over the world, men and women and boys and girls are coming to him and putting their faith in him in order to receive forgiveness and the free gift of eternal life. And they're submitting to him as their king. And in their daily lives, they want to obey him and to do his will and to honor him in all they do and say. When Isaiah spoke about this new king, he was speaking about Christ the king. And when he spoke about people coming to Jerusalem, he was speaking about people coming into the church. And so Isaiah was foretelling how people from every nation will come and put their faith in Christ the king who is the king of kings forever and how happy his people are because he blesses them with one spiritual blessing after another because he gives them justification so that they're pardoned and accepted by God forever. He gives them adoption so that they're added into God's family forever. He gives them sanctification so that they become more and more willing and able to do God's will here on earth. He gives them assurance of God's love and peace of conscience and joy in the Holy Spirit and growth and grace and perseverance to enable them to stand firm in the faith. He gives them the hope of the resurrection and eternal life in God's presence. Christ the King has gifts to give to all who come to him, and he gives them one spiritual blessing after another. And he also promises to give them all the other things they need for life in this world. And how happy they are because of all the good gifts he gives to his people, and nothing he does will ever cause us to raise an eyebrow because everything he does is good, because he is good. And Christ the King invites the weak and the weary to come to him for rest and peace, and he promises that he'll never drive away anyone who comes to him. But he also warns us as well, doesn't he? Uh, do you remember in the Gospels how the Lord Jesus warned the people that the Queen of the South, or the Queen of Sheba, will rise up on the day of judgment and condemn them because she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. She, she traveled so far to see Solomon. But, said the Lord Jesus, one greater than Solomon is here. And, of course, he was referring to himself. He was saying, I'm greater than Solomon, and I'm here. But you're not listening to me, and you don't believe in me. And so he warned that if you continue in your unbelief and if you never put your faith in me, then you'll be condemned forever. But for those who come, there's the promise of forgiveness and there's a promise of eternal life and he's able to give us forgiveness and eternal life and all the rest of his blessings because he paid the cost for our forgiveness when his body was broken and his blood was shed, and he gave up his life on the cross to pay for all that we have done wrong. And because he has paid the cost for us, all who believe in him receive forgiveness and the hope of eternal life in his everlasting kingdom. And so as we take part in the Lord's Supper today, we're reminded of the cost he has paid for our forgiveness, how happy we are to have such a great king over us who loved us so much and the life we have now because of him will continue on and on and on and on and on beyond the grave and beyond the resurrection and into eternity. And so how happy we will be forever standing before Christ our King. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for giving us the King of Kings to be our King. And he loved us so much that his body was broken, his blood was shed to pay the cost for our forgiveness. 
So help us all to trust in him, to rejoice in him, and to look forward to how we'll stand in his presence forever and ever, and how happy we will be. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Let's stand to sing Christ our hope in life and death. Our tokens will be collected now.
Hear the words of the institution of the Lord's Supper as they've been handed down to us by the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. Amen. When we eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord's Supper, we look backwards to the past and the time when the Lord Jesus suffered and died on the cross to pay for all of our sins. And when we eat the bread and drink the cup, we look forward to the future and to the time when the Lord Jesus will come again to gather all of his people and to take us into the new and better world to come. And when we eat the bread and drink the cup, we pray that God, by his Holy Spirit, will work in each one of us today. We pray that today we'll receive by faith all the benefits of Christ's life and death and resurrection so that our faith in Christ is strengthened and our love for one another is enlarged. And so we look to the past and to Christ's death. We look to the future and to the promise of Christ's return. And we pray that today Almighty God will strengthen our faith in the Savior and transform us into his likeness. The table of our Lord is open to members of any branch of the church who confess Jesus Christ as Lord. And they're invited to come with gladness to the table of the Lord and to join us in this sacrament. For the gracious invitation of the Lord Jesus is this. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Let's turn to God in prayer. We praise you, Almighty God, our Father, for you are the one who made the heavens and the earth and all that they contain. We praise you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and was born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate and was crucified, died, and was buried. You on the third day rose again from the dead and ascended to your right hand in heaven from where he'll come to judge the living and the dead. We praise you too for your Holy Spirit who unites us together as members of Christ's church to enjoy fellowship with one another and the assurance of sins forgiven. We thank you too for the hope of the resurrection of our bodies and everlasting life in your presence. And as we turn to the Lord's table, we give thanks to you for the bread and the cup which speak to us of the body of Christ which was broken for us and of his blood which was shed for us. And as we set aside this bread and this drink from all ordinary use, we pray that you'll send your spirit to make this sacrament effective so that as we receive the bread and the cup, we will also by faith receive Jesus Christ and all the benefits of his redemption. So give us assurance of your love and peace of conscience and joy in the Holy Spirit and growth in grace and perseverance. And confirm with our eyes what you've promised to our ears that for the sake of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven and we have peace with you forever. And we ask these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. According to the holy institution, example, and command of our Lord Jesus Christ, and for a memorial of him we do this, the Lord Jesus Christ on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks he broke it, and he said, this is my body which is for you, 
do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord Jesus until he comes again. So come to this table, not because you must, but because you may. Not because you're strong, but because you're weak. Come, not because any goodness of your own gives you the right to come, but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little, and we'd like to love Him more. Come because He loved you and gave Himself for you. Come because Christ invites you, saying, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. Well, remember that you may eat the bread and drink the cup as soon as you uh, receive them. So take, eat, remember, and believe that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was given for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. Take, drink, remember, and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was shed for the complete forgiveness of all our sins.
Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. To Jesus Christ, who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Almighty God, our Father, we thank you for this opportunity to proclaim again our Savior's death, who died that we might live. Enable us to love and obey Him while we go on living on the earth, and bring us at last, together with all your faithful people, to our heavenly home, and to that fullness of joy which you have prepared for all who love you. And to your name be glory and praise forever and ever. Amen. We stand to sing, Behold the Lamb. forth in the name of the Lord. This is God's charge. We should believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as He has commanded us. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.